So a couple of quick announcements for those of you that signed up. Gail Pal is outside, so it looks like most people are aware of that. But um, And then we have our usual announcements about upcoming events. So we've got our certificate programs coming um, in around March 20th. So that's SQL, uh, Data Science for Product Managers, and Deep Learning Part 2. So you can check those out online. There's still space available for those. We've got the Data Institute Conference coming up March 10th. Uh, so you can look online for registration information for that. And then lastly, uh, for any potential students out there, for the Master's in Data Science program starting this coming summer, our final application deadline is right around the corner, so that's March 1st. So if you're interested in that, now is the time to get your application in. Okay. Uh, and now um, we're on to the main event, so we're, we're happy to have uh, one of our own uh, speaking today. So we've got uh, Professor James Wilson. So James is a uh, professor here in the data science program and also up the hill in the mathematics and statistics program. Um, and he's going to talk to us about network embeddings and neuroscience. Thanks, James. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So just making sure, is this good volume? Everybody can hear me? All right, excellent. Um, so thanks so much for being here. I know that some of you have to be here, but I'm glad uh, you know this is your third time seeing me this, uh, this week. Um, but for everyone else that's coming outside of uh, USF, I, I really appreciate the time. I hope you um, enjoy a little bit of some of the research that I've been working on uh, lately. Um, so I come from UNC Chapel Hill, so I got my PhD uh, in North Carolina in 2015. And a lot of what we looked at there was kind of how to think about statistics applied to health. Uh, and you know, at the time, I was actually looking a little bit at, uh, at breast cancer. So I was kind of thinking about genetic analysis. But I was always interested in learning more about the brain. So there's kind of, there's kind of two big things that are uh, going on, it seems, in biostatistics these days. And, and so I've been working with kind of brain data for a very long time. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, unfortunately, the big thing is, <clears throat> up until this time, I really hadn't had much success in trying to understand anything about the brain or making any kind of inference. So the way I want to put that out there is to, to tell you this is a challenging problem. And it's definitely something that could use some of the techniques and tools from data science that folks in this room are developing. Uh, and then researchers, you know, uh, new research ideas kind of borrowed from things like text analysis and from all these other uh, major data science fields and machine learning. Um, we can apply them actually to fMRI. And so that's what I want to motivate today uh, with a, a new method that I've come up with, multi-node to VEC. So before I begin, though, I want to, I want to point out collaborators. Um, so this was a project that I started last year. Um, and so the, the first person, Melanie Bebe, was a uh, master's student in CS here at USF. Um, Paul Stillman is a, is a colleague of mine who is in uh, cognitive neuroscience at now Yale. <clears throat> And then Rishi Sankar, he may look young, and that's because he is. He's in high school, um, but he's at Palo Alto, or no, Henry Gunn High School in Palo Alto, and has done some really incredible work with the coding. And then Abby Popa, who is up front over here, if you want to talk to her, uh, is working with me on this project as well. She is a postdoc here at the Data Institute. So the, the motivation, and by the way, I just want to stop to say if anybody has any questions, please ask as we go along. So I'm, I'm happy to, to talk back and forth as we go. So the, the major motivation of what we're going to be looking at is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So from now on, we'll just call that fMRI. And the, the basic idea right, for fMRI, the data that we're going to be looking at, is imagining that we have kind of this, an individual who typically we're going to think about resting state. So this, this person, person is told to rest. So to relax, not to do anything, which may seem hard for those out there that are claustrophobic. I, I myself am claustrophobic. I don't think I could rest when I'm in such a tube. But the idea is that what they're trying to do is measure overall blood flow through their brain at any given moment in time. Right? So they're asked to be at rest for about two or three minutes. And so what ends up happening is when we're uh, measuring this blood flow overall, then we're getting images that look something like this. So we can, we can imagine that we can see an image of how the brain is kind of operating at that given moment. <clears throat> so really what this is doing is it's measuring the functional activity of the brain over time. So we're trying to say, how is the brain functioning? And the typical measurement is, is blood oxygen level dependence, also known as bold contrast. Um, and this can be taken, so I was saying about resting state, so asked to rest. But there's other uh, situations where you can think about task-oriented data. So you can imagine 
the person's asked to identify or to click a button whenever they see a certain image, right? There's, there's all sorts of uh, types of tasks we could think about, but it kind of activates different parts of your brain according to the tasks that you're asked to complete. So data in this, though, is uh, recorded for small cross sections of the brain known as voxels. So in this, just to give you an idea, so the way that we kind of parse these images is through a voxel. It, these images are collected over time. Uh, and then the brain itself, the image itself, is kind of segmented into these really small cubes. So typically like a one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter uh, cube called a voxel. And these voxels each have a, an amount of flow, of blood flow, this bold response, going through at a given time. So for resting state, if we have our time ending up being total T, then we're just observing a time series uh, for each voxel. Okay. Um, one question about the data. So this time series is always kind of well aligned. Like how do you make sure that these things are in the same position? Great. So I should say, so that, that is a great question. So the, the question was how do we make sure that the scans at any given time are aligned? And there is a lot of work going on in this area. Um, I actually argue with some of it, so we can, we can talk more about this. But there's a lot of pre-processing that happens to go from the image to the actual um, data that we get like this time series. And part of that is registration. So trying to understand how do we go about registering one image to another um, and also handling motion. So there's a lot of stuff that's regressed out. Uh, there's also this process of then saying, okay, we want to make sure that we're recording the exact same voxel this entire time, and we also don't want spurious observations. So there's some regression going on to kind of regress out this, uh, these anomalous points. And then what we end up with is this time series. So you're absolutely right. There's a lot of pre-processing. Um, so, but to that point, I should say, I'm starting from this time series. So there, there was pre-processing that happened. I'm going to accept it for the moment. So I'm working on not accepting it. So I'm working on the other parts too. Um, so, okay, so you can imagine if we went through all this pre-processing, uh, we end up getting to a time series for each voxel. And in many cases for high resolution scans, we can have up to a million voxels, right? So we, we have a lot of data over time. Well, of course, we wouldn't want to exactly analyze a million voxels saying that they're all dependent in some way all at the same time, or at least this is a big data problem, right? So we, we run into an issue of trying to analyze all these things at the same time. So there's kind of a process, and this image is not mine, it's from this, uh, this paper here, but just to, just to show you, so there's many different types of measurements you could take on kind of trying to understand the, functional, the function of the brain, and that's what's happening here at the top. So here I'm looking at, you can imagine EEG or fMRI are, are two different types of measurements for this type of data. And so they lead to these voxel-based time series. And then what happens is actually these time series, which I'll, I'll specify this in a second, are applied to now a template where this template has been defined actually from clustering. So this is, this is the thing. There's a lot of data science going on behind the scenes. Um, so, and I'll, I'll mention that in a second, but this template is chosen based on clustering of these voxels into tightly related groups of voxels. And once that happens, we then get what are called regions, and we want to look at the connectivity matrix, so kind of the overall relationships of each one of these regions to one another by aggregating over time. Right, so what you can imagine is there's a lot of aggregation going on here. So first, there's kind of this clustering process that's happening once you have the voxels to get a lower dimensional kind of regional uh, mapping. And then we have these relationships that are then kind of squishing or aggregating over time. Right, so you can imagine looking at correlations or something like this over time. And then from that, we analyze this connectivity matrix, which, is, which can also be seen as a network. Um, and we think about analyzing the brain network using, say, graph analysis. Right? So there's a lot of network analysis that we can do here. So is everybody okay with that thus far? The, uh, so the, the interesting thing though, you know, for diffusion MRI, I should say, so there's also structural uh, views of the brain as well. So note there are differences between structural and functional. Structural now is actually looking at things like white matter and connective tissues between parts of the brain. And so in that, we don't have to worry about the same time series that we had before, but rather we're just looking at the overall kind of structure and the, the mass of tissue in between these regions. And we can do a similar thing to apply a mapping to then get a reduced dimension kind of structural view of what's happening. So this is anatomical. But we're not going to be focusing on that. We're going to be looking at fMRI. <clears throat> so specifically, some of the stuff I was talking about is we start with voxels, where there's about a million of them. Say, in, in the data that I usually handle, there's around 900,000. And so there's clustering that happens. And this clustering is actually 
um, what people usually call applying a brain parcellation or an atlas. And so there's a lot of atlases that are out there that folks look at, but it is based off of clustering. And once we do that, then we get regions, right? So we're going we're gonna to end up having uh, regions of interest, also often known as ROIs. And once we have that, then we say, well, let's measure the functional relationships between these regions using an adjacency matrix or this connectivity matrix that we were looking at. So essentially, the entries AUV are just going to be, say, the correlation of XU and XV, where these XU is just a time series of the bold response over region U. Okay, so now we have an adjacency matrix, and we can actually start to analyze this using network techniques. And network techniques have actually led to a lot of interesting findings as far as uh, looking at a, a single brain. So in looking at an individual, um, we've identified, or not we, not, I have not personally done this, but I see it as well. Um, <clears throat> but it's been identified that the brain has high modularity. So this is kind of a common thing in clustering of networks, uh, where what it's saying is that these uh, regions of interest are going to cluster very closely to functional subregions. right? And not only that, but these subregions are kind of really related to one another, but not very related to anything outside of it. Right? So you can imagine kind of different areas in your brain really um, interacting with one another or being excited at the same time that another part of your brain is excited as well as being activated. Uh, and then another thing is this idea of uh, what's called the rich club. So this is kind of the, the classic power law situation. So if we look at these types of networks, then what we end up seeing are hub regions, meaning there are certain parts of the brain that are really highly connected to lots of other parts in the brain, right? But then there are a lot of, I mean, that's, there's a few of these, right? And, and then there's a lot, uh, maybe say 80% of the voxels overall are not connected, are sparsely connected. So they're, they're barely related to any of the other voxels in the brain. And probably the biggest, kind of the biggest splash that I've heard of anyway from network science is what's called the small world structure. Um, which is something that was borrowed from social, uh, social network analysis. Um, but the, the idea is, what, it, what it's saying is that there is high clustering overall, but small diameter in the whole brain. So what that means is, kind of going back to the high modularity, we do have a, a, um, the, the regions overall cluster really tightly with one another, but the small diameter is saying that you can very easily, if you imagine this as a network, travel from one region to another. Right? So there's a shortest, the shortest path between any two regions is quite small. <clears throat> Biologically, there's implications, right? So the, the idea is we have all these nice observations, um, but regions exhibit strong clustering that minimize wiring costs. So we can try to understand what exactly is this saying in terms of the function of the brain. Um, and moreover, that the brain maintains robust transfer and integration of information across, across regions. And then finally, it, it gives us a better understanding of learning and memory, cognitive control, and emotion, right? And so there's been a lot of projects that have been motivated by these kind of original network findings, including the Brain Initiative as well as the Human Connectome Project. So there's a lot of stuff still going on. But now I want to take a step back and say, well, I, I've told you a little bit about kind of the complications already and the, the hard part of analyzing a single brain, but I'm interested in making that an even harder problem. Okay? So I want to say, let's not just look at one brain. Because if we're thinking about statistics, by the way, I, you know, I got my training in statistics, the idea is you want a high sample size, right? You want large samples. Like, we're looking at a lot of voxels, but the thing is, you know, we have noise, we have, we have complications along the way for each individual, but can we make use of actually looking over these types of fMRI data over groups of individuals? So if we have a group of individuals that have, say, a similar clinical diagnosis, or perhaps they're all healthy, kind of healthy controls, as they call them, Maybe we can actually jointly use these network representations to say something more, uh, more reliable and with more power about these groups, right? about the function of the brain. And so that's our real aim. So how can we go about actually analyzing uh, fMRI over groups of individuals? And then more than that, you know, once we start to analyze groups of individuals, well, then we have groups that have different types of um, different types of actual uh, clinical diagnoses, like I was saying. So you can imagine that someone may have, a, uh, may have schizophrenia or may have ADHD or perhaps a group of uh, folks that had concussion. So the, the overall aim is to say if we can say something about each one of these groups and then compare them in a reliable way, then we can really start to make a difference in, uh, in kind of understanding these different groups. So that's what we're aiming for. But 
if we're analyzing a group, we can't just look at one network. Right? So I, the way that I'm viewing this is actually I'm saying, well, if we have a group of individuals, we're, gonna, we're going to model them instead using what's called a multi-layer network. And so a multi-layer network is, as maybe as you would think, is just a sequence of graphs. Right? So you can imagine here now we have instead three brain snapshots. So in snapshots, I guess what I mean by this is three different individuals. All right? So I'm thinking about three different individuals here. We get a voxel-based uh, time series for each of them over resting state. And then for each of them, we get a network right, for every individual. So now the question is, how can we analyze this sequence of graphs? And so for a group of size m, there are m different layers. So you can imagine we're just looking at m layers overall, where layer j, so the jth layer, is going to model the functional relationships in that individual. Right, so this is, this is what we're basing it on. And so our data that we're going to be interested in analyzing is now a sequence of graphs, g1 through gn, with the adjacencies a1 through an. All right, so I want to pause for a second and say, how do you think we go about analyzing such a sequence of graphs? Does anybody have any thoughts? Any thoughts would do. This may be good for research, but I also am curious. So maybe the, the first way that anybody ever looked at this was, say, take an average, right? So we have a group, so why not take an average and kind of look at the either consensus or average of these graphs and analyze that? Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's reasonable. Um, it's assuming that, they're, that essentially each one of these graphs, though, we're kind of getting rid of the variability of each one of these graphs, right? We're trying to kind of, we're merging over too many kind of variable pieces. Um, but it is, it is an option. Uh, and then the other thing might be, well, let's just look at each one of them separately and try to kind of summarize what we get over looking at them separately. And these, in fact, were the first two strategies for really trying to understand multilayer graphs. But all I'm trying to say is that actually directly analyzing multilayer graphs, none of, you, none of you answered, which to me makes me think this is not an easy problem, right? And it's not. Uh, so, and I, I've worked with multilayer graphs for a very long time, since my, uh, since my grad school days. And the idea, they're extremely complex. So we're no longer looking at things, we no longer have independence anywhere, right? So we're saying that every region that's connected to another region, they're dependent upon each other. And so the whole graph is this thing of size, say, n. And so without further constraints, we're looking at n squared times m different variables, right? So we have a, we have a lot of dependent variables going on. And so computational methods for this are often slow. Uh, and summaries are not well understood. So I mean, you can propose summaries, and there's, there's a lot of work on this, but it's still not understood what we should, how we should summarize these graphs in the best way. Yes? So does, does n represent the number of regions? Yes, that's right. That's right, that's right. So here, n represents the number of regions. Yep. Roughly, what's the range of the number of regions? Yeah, so that actually depends on the parcellation. Um, but a very common one is called the power atlas, uh, which has 264. So they may be looking at, say, 264 different regions. Um, and in most in the, at least in the examples, we're looking at around 70 different individuals. Mm -hmm. But it can be much larger. So the, these atlases can go up to thousands, depending on the granularity that you want. Mm -hmm. Do I have labeled data? So the, the groups themselves, so where I am headed, is uh, that we have groups of some sort of clinical outcome. So we, we know whether or not they're healthy controls, or if they're a group that, say, have a concussion, or if they're a group that, say, have schizophrenia. So that's, that's the only labels that we have. Ah. They have, yes. Yeah, in fact, that's, that's used very often, even at the voxel level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but actually, you should talk to Ginny, who's in here as well, about that. So she's applying that now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so OK, we're taking a network approach. We're saying, well, we want to look at groups, so we get this multi-layer network representation. And overall, I'm just saying this is hard, uh, because the dimension is incredibly high. And so what we decide to do is what's called node embedding. And this is, this is what I'm motivated by, is the kind of difficulty of actually analyzing these types of graphs. And so very simply, the idea, you know, if I'm just giving a general view of what we're doing when we're embedding, 
Um, so this is the same type of embedding that you think about when you think about things like word to vec. Um, so in text analysis, when you're embedding uh, text overall to a vector, we're doing the same idea here. We're just saying we're going to embed now the sequence G1 through GM, so this multi-layer graph, and we're going to be thinking about the nodes, right? So we're going to embed this on the overall set of unique nodes, big, big N here. Um, and so the aim is to learn an interpretable low dimensional feature representation of the set of nodes. All right, so the idea is we're looking for a function, essentially f, that maps now our nodes in the graph to just rd. All right, so we're looking for continuous vectors that can tell us something about the nodes in the graph. All right, so f can be viewed as an n by d matrix whose rows represent the embedding of each node in n. All right, everybody following along? <clears throat> so, Yes? Uh, do all of the individuals have the same nodes? In this case, yes. Um, so in some cases, no. So that's, uh, it's, I'm, do, I'm writing this in a more general way than it needs to be. Um, but in our, in our case of multiple individuals across the same fMRI scan, we are assuming they have the same nodes. Mm -hmm. So going back to the Power Atlas, we'd be looking at 264 nodes. Yes? Uh, regularization, so at what point? Uh, after we get the embeddings or, or before? Um, so all of the pre-processing is coming in from the stages of that process of leading to the voxels in the first place, uh, which is kind of coming from making sure you don't have these anomalies in the time series and, uh, and other smoothing um, effects there. But once we have the time series of the voxels, we don't do any other um, we don't do any other smoothing or, or anything to the nodes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Are these embeddings from, I'm sorry? Aha, uh, we're getting there. Let me answer that question in the next few slides. <laughs> so, okay, so now taking the step back, right? So I, you understand that I'm aiming for an embedding of multi-layer networks, what do I mean, right? So it's motivated by the, the machine learning method word to vec. So the, the main idea here, right, um, and word to vec, by the way, for those who are familiar with the method, when I first read the original paper about this, I had no idea what was going on, I'll, 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 be, I'll admit. But then I realized there were like three other papers that said explaining word to vec. So I, I hope that when I write a paper that we don't have to explain it three times. I'm hoping for that. Though it's a, obviously it's an awesome method, right? So I, I, I totally agree. Uh, but it took me a while to understand it. But this plot, this does a pretty good job. So the idea is essentially we're just aiming to identify word feature embeddings, embeddings via word contexts, right? So we have, we have sentences like the following. And we may say, suppose that we're looking at a context of size two. So all I mean by context is kind of what words are closest to the given word. So we, we do a window search. So we kind of say, here's our word here, then we're going to look out two words and see which words are associated with it. And from that, we're getting tuples, right, to say, okay, V is related to quick and V is related to brown. And we keep doing that, right? So we kind of scan through the entire sentence um, in a smart way to where we get quick is related to V, quick is related to brown, and also fox, right? And we keep extending this. So we're getting these ideas kind of from a training set of what these overall what you could call a bag of words, right? So we're looking at now collections of words um, that we can use to try to train our model. So this led to very recently in 2016, um, what's called deep walk line and node to vec for networks. So now we're kind of using this idea and saying, well, look, now we're in the space of networks. So we have nodes that are connected to other nodes. Actually, this makes a lot of sense. So in a word embedding, we're just looking to the left and right of words to kind of identify a context. In a network, though, we're looking at actual neighborhoods of a given node. Well, this is already defined. So we, we understand what a neighborhood is. So a context in this case is just saying, well, if we're looking, say, at this, this red node here, it's connected to this node and this node, right? So that gives us a natural way of understanding what the collection and kind of the relationships among nodes. So our edges are actually helping us here. Um, and so applying things like node to vec or, or deep walk is essentially figuring out how to define what a context actually is, right? So defining what a neighborhood is. And there's different ways of doing that. 
Um, the way I just told you was just looking at connected, other connected nodes, but we could do this in other ways as well. Um, so, but then the end result is to say we can embed this into a continuous space. So imagine that we just have two dimensions, right? And we can start to see how these nodes differ according to this kind of plotting. Okay? So now what I want you to imagine, this is a very small network and it's been analyzed way too many times. Um, but, but the point is that we have some understanding classes for each one of these nodes. And so what we're wondering is if we map this into a lower dimensional space, can we identify those same classes? This is small though. Imagine now that you have a really large network where you can no longer visualize the structure as nicely as you can visualize this one, right? And that's, that's what we're interested in, doing that over a sequence of graphs. Okay. So <clears throat> our proposed idea uh, is what's called multi-node to VEC. And so the, the whole point, this is kind of the, the template of everything we're going to do, right? So the, the idea is to take a multi-layer network, which now we're imagining our individuals with different scans, right? So we've kind of brought it down to a, to a network sequence. We apply a neighborhood search to get what we're calling a bag of nodes. Now, I thought this was pretty witty. I, I hope that you appreciate this term as well. I really wanted to start something here. Uh, this was my own coining of this word uh, or this uh, phrase. So we get a bag of nodes, right? It's just a collection of neighborhoods. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to say. So we got to somehow identify neighborhoods and get this collection. Um, and then from the bag of nodes, we're going to run this through a skipgram neural network model. So we just do a, a, a very simple um, one layer neural network, uh, which is related, again, this is the same process as happening in word to vec right? So because now we actually have the same type of data uh, to plug into this framework. And then at the end, what we're going to get is the weighting matrix, F, which is just an N by D feature matrix. So this is going to be the feature matrix overall that we look at, where each column now represents the features and each row represents the nodes of the graph. Okay. And so I'm a statistician, so I have to write this down. Um, but there's a point, there's a reason why I'm writing this down too. It is a likelihood problem. So, uh, you know, as all, if you ever write a stats paper, you have to make sure you show that it's a likelihood problem in some way, just to be honest about it. Um, but I didn't have to write this down. We could have also just went for it and tried the skip gram method and see what happened. But you can, you can view this whole process as a likelihood maximization problem. Uh, and so in, in doing that, you know, we're, we're assuming that we observe a multi-layer network and we think about, we still need to define what I mean by a neighborhood, but imagine that we do define this and let N, uh, NE of U be the neighborhood of U, then learning F can be formulated as just maxim, uh, maximizing overall this joint probability matrix, right? So we're just looking at the joint probability over the graph. This is a complex structure. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, given now our features, right? So our feature matrix. And so something that is done, and I'm, I'm hiding it a little bit, but I'm happy to talk about it, is that there are some conditional independence assumptions. And so the conditional independence is essentially saying if you know the feature for a node, then the no, that node itself is conditionally independent of everything else, right, of all the other nodes. So kind of knowing the feature itself is enough. That kind of is characterizing our dependence. And so once we do that, we can get a nice form like the following uh, that can then be optimized. So now, how do we optimize that, right? So that's, that's this kind of the skip gram idea is to say, well, first of all, we need to define what we mean by neighborhoods. And so we do this by identifying what I'm calling multi-layer network neighborhoods. And this relies upon a second order random walk. Okay, so we want to keep this entire thing fast while still coming up with a, a good answer for this likelihood maximization. Um, and then for optimization, it's simply maximizing the likelihood function described by the multi-layer system. And this is done through skip gram um, from the neighborhoods in step one. All right, so that means there's kind of two important parts. And the kind of the new part of multi-node to VEC is exactly how to define the neighborhoods, right? So this is, this is kind of the, the novelty here. Um, because now we have multiple layers, right? And we're not saying that if we're in one layer or another that a node is necessarily connected to another node in a different layer. But in walking and in thinking about the overall graph, if we want to join the structure, like we want to use all the information from all of these layers, a way to do that is randomly let a node go to itself in another layer, right? So if we start in this example with layer one at node V, we can walk to several things. First of all, we can walk to any nodes that it's connected to. 
right, which are the actual neighborhoods in that layer. And then we can walk to itself in another layer. Right? So there are variants that can be done here, but I thought this was maybe the simplest first strategy uh, was to allow this to happen. And, and so overall, what we're imagining is that we have the random walk just traversed from node T to node V in layer one. Uh, then the next node, uh, so it's a node layer pair, right? So we may be in the same layer or maybe not, um, will occur with probabilities proportional to alpha times the edge weight between the two nodes. So we want to take into account the actual edge weight, because uh, this can be a weighted graph overall. Um, but then we have this kind of alpha that's dictated by these hyperparameters that we have to we have to think about whenever we're applying this method. Yes? So why not use correlations between time series for individuals to connect layers? Yeah, we could totally do that. Just just have not. But that, that's yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah, the, the first focus for me was to just boil it down to each individual, but I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a natural way to, to try to come up with correlations mm -hmm. or to come up with dependencies. So, yes? So, so if I understand, you are <coughs> basically training this and in a, a supervised way, right? That's right. But you have labels. <coughs> but we have labels not for each node. Uh, Okay, then let's, let's do it. So we should talk. <laughs> no, this is good. This is just preliminary. I like it. So we've got two great ideas. We could, sounds like we could write new papers. Uh, but that's, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that's awesome uh, to be able to train it even better. Um, so you're right. We are being unsupervised about this. Um, and actually, if you really boil down to it, we do actually have labels for the nodes as well, which is something like which functional subnetwork is it contained in, right? So we can, we can even go further. Yeah. Great. Other, other great ideas that I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with you on? All right, awesome. This is why I love having these talks, right? So they're, they're, they're stimulating. So anyway, the idea is to move from one layer to the next or within the same layer. Uh, so the overall neighborhood search procedure is doing the following. You know, we have three main parameters. And, uh, and so the, the kind of new parameter here is this R, which is the layer walk parameter. And so we can think about optimizing this by saying if R is very small, that's going to encourage um, layer sampling, right? So here you can see the probability, this kind of weighted probability, one over R. So if R is small, then this is going to be quite large. It'll move from layer to layer quite often. So we're trying to kind of borrow strength across these layers. If it's high on the other hand, then we're going to try to stay in the same, same layer. So in a way, this is kind of, there, this R completely dictates the overall way of saying, are we looking at these layers individually? Or are we really trying to use the structure from all of the layers in the multi-layer network? So it kind of, it gives us the dependency between, between different graphs. P is a return parameter. So low values here encourage revisiting nodes. So it's saying, are we allowed to kind of go back to where we started or where, uh, what we just visited? And in doing so, then we can kind of be at that node and then start browsing away from, uh, from the previously visited node. So you can see when we, when we have a P here, we're saying the walk just went from T to V, right? So now what's the likelihood of actually going back to the thing we just saw? We can, we can actually set that using this parameter as well. And then finally, Q is the exploration parameter. And I should say it's the inner layer exploration parameter, right? Which means low values here are encouraging within layer exploration. So you can see now going to other neighborhoods, uh, sorry, X2 or X3 is some one over Q, right? So we're saying overall, we're going to move from V to a new value, a new node that we haven't visited yet with a uh, likelihood related to 1 over Q. Yes? So what's the motivation for uh, having the random walk remember where it came from? So this was actually, um, a, a moment ago I was saying there was deep line, line, and node to vec. So the, the kind of the way that this was developed was deep walk was originally just saying do a random walk, right? It, it wasn't trying to remember where it was or kind of have this option of going back or forward. Um, what no Tevec brought to the table was actually this Q and P. So saying, in general, what we're trying to do is dictate how far out in the network do we want to go um, versus do we just want to get the neighborhood that's defined on that node, right? So it's, it's giving flexibility for what we define as a neighborhood. Uh, and in general, a way to think about that is maybe the data that you got wasn't perfect. So it's okay to kind of go beyond the actual neighborhood that you observe. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's it, performance-wise, it does much better. That, that's that's what's been shown. Cool. 
All right. Great. So, so good. So that, that is how we're actually coming up with now our neighborhoods of, of nodes. Um, and oh, I, sorry. Sorry to keep flashing back. Uh, so the biased random walk. So this is a biased random walk based on that value alpha. Um, our repeated s times and each, each are set to length l. Right? So we, we have a, a walk length of length l. And so once we do that, then the collection of neighborhoods, the bag of nodes, um, is now passed to a skip gram neural network model where the weight matrix is calculating using, calculated using stochastic gradient descent. So there's a, there's a very classic way of implementing this. Um, I won't go into too many details about that, but it's, a, it's fun to read about. Um, so some overall properties, well, we've already talked about this, but it's an approximate algorithm, right? So this is not an exact algorithm. Uh, it depends on stochastic neighborhood identification. So this is a random process based on the random walk. It's a multi-layer generalization of node to vec. So that paper that came out in 2016, we're, we're generalizing this to handle sequences of graphs. Um, complexity, actually, this can be done, so the random walks can be done in constant time. Um, and optimization overall is linear in the number of distinct nodes in the multi-layer network. So it's, when I say, so, you know, I, I've developed a lot of methodologies before. This one's by all means the fastest and has given me the most insights out of anything else I've ever developed. So I'm, I'm excited to say it's very fast. Uh, and I have Python code that I have at the end, too, if you're interested in using it. Um, and it's a likelihood-based strategy. So I have to say that because I'm a statistician. So we, we need to put that up. Um, OK, so now let's use it, right? And there's, you know, there's more theoretical ideas behind this. And in the paper, I, I put them in there, too. We may have time for it. But I really want to talk about the application of this. So to begin with, we're looking at healthy controls. So we're saying, imagine that we have a group of healthy individuals. Um, so they're non-alcoholic, and they don't have a neurological disorder or brain injury. So that's, that's what we mean by healthy control. And we have fMRI scans under resting state. So this is originally from the following study. So it's the Center for Biomedical Research Excellence Study. So this data is publicly available. Um, and if you want access to it, I have it in an even more parsed down version uh, that's easier to handle than directly from the website. I realize this neuroscience data is not always easy to handle right off the bat. Um, but anyway, so I have some simpler to digest uh, data sets. And it's available at the 1000 Functional uh, Connectomes Project. So to give you an idea, as I was saying before, you know, we have this network that biologically, these kind of functional subnetworks have been identified. Um, so within each brain, we kind of have these regions that we know of, like the following. So maybe some have heard of the default mode network, which is kind of the thing that's active when you're sleeping. Right? So when you're relaxing, it's the thing that's still operating. Um, but then we have many different regions that are known to, um, to handle different problems, right? Or, or sorry, different tasks. So for instance, memory and retrieval, ventral attention, um, cerebellar, visual, et cetera. So we can just think about these different groups. Um, for the atlas that we apply, this is the breakdown of the number of vertices or nodes that are in each one of these functional subnetworks. Okay? So you can imagine that each node now is labeled according to this. So in the case study, you know, to begin with, we wanted to validate that this is actually useful, right? So I mean that this embedding method is useful. Those functional subnetworks we know biologically exist, right? So we can use this as a label to say, what are these embeddings actually telling us? Well, let's relate it back to the functional subnetworks to begin with. So visualization, the idea is do embeddings organize according to functional subregions? And so we look at an embedding of dimension 100. I've actually looked from two up to several thousand uh, just to play around with this. But you'll see in a second that these dimension, if the dimension is even around like 20 or 30, we actually get quite nice results as far as relating back to the functional subnetwork. Um, and then clustering, obviously you want to say how well do the embeddings cluster according to subregions? And so we try just using a very simple clustering method, k-means, nothing fancy, uh, using the embeddings of dimension d. So we're then going to look at clusterings to see how well that also corresponds to the functional subregions. And finally, we'll, we'll formalize this in classification, right? Since we have a label, we can do a one versus all logistic regression to say, well, OK, let's take these regions, say we know, we know the label for everybody, I mean, for all the things that we're incorporating in our classification model, and then can we predict a new, a new node based on its embedding? And then lastly, and the big thing that we're really starting to aim for is group comparison, right? So now I have another group of patients with schizophrenia that I would like to say, can we use these embeddings to actually compare them? So the first thing, kind of visualization of healthy controls. 
I have a better picture in a second. This was my original picture. Um, so the idea is, you know, we have 100 different features. So this was absolutely handpicked by me, I should say. Um, but at least it gave me some hope, right? So I kind of looked at this massive plot of a lot of different uh, one against another features to see if I could see any type of clustering. I can at least see clustering here. You know, this, this seems hopeful to me, right? Because uh, these now, yeah, every node in this space, this is uh, looking at feature seven and feature eight and looking um, compared to one another and they're colored based on their subregion, right? So we, can, we get some hope from feature seven and feature eight. Um, I'm hopeful that it's elsewhere, but I didn't worry about trying to show the entire plot of 100 by 100. Um, so at any rate, we get some hope. But there's better ways of, of uh, summarizing this using something like TSNE. And I should thank Abby Popa for giving me this idea. Um, so we can then embed the overall, oh, actually we're embedding the embeddings, right? So we're talking about lots of embedding, right? But the, that's the point. So we now have these continuous vectors that we can embed yet again into an even simpler to understand space and look to see what TSNE does to the overall embeddings. Now we can see serious clustering. So this, was, this is nice, right? It's kind of summarizing the overall dimensions of uh, what we found for these features. And indeed, here we have healthy controls against uh, patients with schizophrenia. We start to see a little bit of differences too, just as far as kind of relationships among these different, um, these different voxels or areas. So, um, so what ends up happening? I mean, for instance, if we look at something that we kind of expect, so there's, there's nice theory to say, we bet that the default mode network, which is here, is quite a bit different among healthy controls than it is in patients with schizophrenia. And so in here, we see kind of, there's a little bit more variability, right, in this overall embedding. We're kind of seeing things are further apart, but there's also some kind of mixing of other, of other regions starting to overlap with the default mode network. So we're really getting some understanding of the structure between these two different subgroups. And I look at kind of how overall, just in the healthy controls, do these groups actually cluster? And we end up seeing even, even with one dimension, we still get kind of an 84% clustering rate, right? So if we're looking at um, the adjusted RAND index of kind of take the best 13 clusters and compare it to now the actual functional subregions, we end up getting a pretty good result even for dimension down to one. We only reached about a 0.9 adjusted RAND but there was variability there. So, and this was applying multi-node DVEC with several values of R. So just kind of validating to us that we're getting something, right? So we're at least starting to see there's clustering according to the functional subregions. And don't worry about this plot. Let me just talk about it. Uh, Cause I, I realized the print is way too small and I apologize for that. Um, but the basic idea is now we can further validate the use of multi-node DVEC against very common methods. So we have that line method that I was talking about, deep walk as well as spectral clustering. So we can apply all of these types of methods on a consensus matrix, right? So these kind of single network methods can be applied to an average. And when we do that, we realize we actually find that multi-node to VEC is better. It outperforms quite a bit in terms of classification rate um, or AUC in this case. Um, the competing methods in many different regions. So here is just one example to show kind of the comparisons of these. I don't want to go into too much detail except multi-node DVEC is doing quite well. Uh, and we see that other methods, when we reach a certain dimension and start taking averages, do reasonably well too in the healthy controls. So this is kind of an interesting finding. Spectral clustering was the only thing that did not do well. Um, I have reasons for that, or I have thoughts for that, um, which is just essentially we're getting too much variability for spectral clustering to work well, but also it wasn't regularized. So I think these things need to be regularized in order to get a more meaningful embedding. All right, but now <clears throat> group comparisons is kind of what we'd really like to do. And one thing that I can mention up front is that actually taking embeddings from different groups. So imagine you're doing this multi-node to VEC on different groups and you have two embedding matrices now, right? So one for healthy controls and another for uh, patients with schizophrenia. They're hard to compare by itself, right? Because we don't quite understand what these features actually are. So, and there's, there's kind of a correspondence issue of what we're looking at here. And so it's, it's not directly comparable. But what we can do is look at within embedding measures. So we can try to say, let's summarize the embedding matrices within each group and then compare those summaries overall. So this is a, a strategy that I'm taking on. I should say there's, there's other ways of doing this. So I kind of went with the the variability way of looking at this, and 
again, using something like a t-test to see if there actually are differences. Um, but in, in future work, which Abby, I think, will talk about later, um, we're using much more kind of relevant, I think, um, types, of, uh, types of metrics for analyzing this as well that are common in the text analysis literature. So my advisor when I was a PhD student told me never put a table in a, in a presentation. And I totally agree with him. I put it here just to show you there are some with stars. That's what I really want you to notice. Uh, because otherwise, there's no point in reading all of this, right? But I want to summarize what happened, which is essentially in this, we're looking at this overall measure of kind of within functional subnetwork variability. This is what we're trying to measure. So we have actual values for every functional subnetwork. Uh, sub so we're going to look at the mean embedding and then calculate the overall variability of the embeddings of all the other nodes within, within the same group, right? So within the same functional subnetwork. So the idea here is the higher the variability, kind of the more uncertainty that's involved in these different embeddings, right? So that, that, was our, that was our goal. So what we actually did a test for was to say, well, if we measure this kind of within subnetwork variability, let's compare directly the, that of, fun, of the uh, patient group with healthy controls. So what we would hope to see, or we'd hope to actually see that there are significant differences between some of these uh, variability measures, and we do find significant differences in the default mode network as well as the salience network. So we see overall that the variability, this was, uh, in this case, we're looking at a two-sided 95% confidence interval where it was healthy controls minus now um, patients with schizophrenia. So what we're seeing is that overall the variability is less in the healthy controls than it was in the patient group in both of those functional subnetworks. And this is interesting. So the idea is we're actually identifying these differences based on our embeddings. And it is, it correlates with what's called, or it's well supported by this triple network model theory. Not to, network is not the same network that I'm thinking about here, but that just so happened is the name of the theory. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of um, literature even back to 2010, that believes that, you know, or, or posits, you know, theoretically, that there'll be decreased uh, segregation between the DMN and central executive networks among schizophrenics, right? So among patients with schizophrenia. And in this, we are able to actually identify these changes, these differences. So this is, I won't say it's necessarily the first time people have been able to find these kinds of things, but it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's quite, a, it's quite a good find coming from a, a newly developed embedding method and not something you would immediately get from just trying to cluster or start to look at these different groups. So, so we, we identify that using that, uh, that metric. And with the other metrics that we look at, we identify the same thing. So we are seeing these differences. So I don't know that I have time. Um, I want to at least say that there's also some theoretical analysis of multi node to VEC in general, kind of saying, you know, we have these neural network models um, and strategies that we use, and often it's not, like I said, understandable, right? So what do, you, what do these features actually mean? Well, there, there is some good research going on these days about trying to better analyze these kinds of things. And I just want to say that I, I borrowed some, some uh, theoretical results from where to VEC, what's actually been going on here. But what we can actually look at is to say the following, that multi node to VEC is an approximate algorithm that relies on the identification of neighborhoods um, via random walks, right? So these random walks are kind of where the stochastic nature of this, of this method is coming in. And so we can analyze the limiting behavior of the algorithm when the length of the random walk tends to infinity. So we say, what if we had a, an infinitely long random walk to identify these neighborhoods? Then what could we say about the results that we would get? And the key result is actually that we can show that the results of multi node to VEC converge in probability um, to that of implicit matrix factorization. So this process of running multi node to VEC is the same as running a, or in the limit of the, of the random walk, um, is the same as running matrix factorization on an adjusted adjacency matrix. So if we look at some form of the um, average adjacency matrix, we can get the same type of thing, which is hopeful because this gives us intuition as to exactly what these embeddings are telling us because matrix factorization is much more well understood currently uh, than, than looking at kind of deep learning or neural networks. So I'm hopeful. Um, I, so in this, 
I won't go through this, but I'll pass along on the meetup for those who came the uh, slides if you're interested in looking more into the math. Also the paper at the end, I'll, since I'm running out of time, I don't want to go through all the details. But it's, it's pretty fun to read up on this literature. So for instance, the main, the main idea is coming from this paper, which was in uh, Neurolips, Neurips, um, the neural word embedding as implicit matrix factorization. So this was actually looking at word to vec and how can we start to uh, look at this as implicit matrix factorization. You can apply these types of methods now to a multi-layer network and get related ideas. And it kind of, it depends on the Markov chain, right? So the Markov chain defined by, yeah, I know. So all the students in here just had Markov chains and a test on it yesterday. Um, so I'm here to tell you they're useful, right? So we can actually do things with them. Um, anyway, so this is the kind of result we get. I'm just putting that up there to say, look into it if you're more, if you're still interested. Um, but the, the overall idea, so for a summary, you know, we introduced a scalable method um, for calculating multilayer network embeddings. And indeed, I, I didn't tell you how long it takes, but approximately for a group uh, for these 74 individuals where we had 264 nodes in each graph, it took about an hour, and this was using my own computer, right? Which isn't bad. Uh, so for kind of neuroscience and thinking about how to actually start applying these things, we can make this faster, but just using my own computer for an hour, I'm okay with that, right? So I can, I can kind of sit back and do something different for an hour, like write, write some of this theory and then come back. Um, but we're hoping to make it faster, but still, it's reasonably fast for these kinds of graphs. Um, we applied multi-node to VEC uh, to group fMRI scans on healthy and schizophrenic groups. The healthy embeddings, healthy group embeddings closely match the functional organization of the brain, and we're able to actually distinguish the two groups in two functional subgroups, which is well supported by theory that's already out there. Right, so, and also we analyze the limiting behavior, but I didn't talk too much about that, but we can actually relate this method back to neuro, um, matrix factorization. So some big questions here, right, are what exactly do these feature, feature embeddings tell us? And I think this is always the question, at least for me, of uh, what these kind of neural networks are saying, right? So we, we get something, it's useful, but why, right? So I'm, I'm interested in that question. Um, and so can they differentiate multilayer networks better than state-of-the-art graph distance metrics. So kind of the typical way would be to try to take some sort of distance metric between graphs and say, you know, how well does that do for kind of classifying graphs? Um, I, I can tell you these things take an incredible amount of time to, to calculate distances between graphs. Um, so ours is definitely faster than this. Um, and then I'm actually interested also in change point analysis of graphs, kind of saying if we have dynamic graphs that change through time, can we identify such changes? So I wanna, I wanna try to use these embeddings to see what I can do there. And also apply this, I have, a, I have a lot of data, thankfully, as far as kind of fMRI subgroups. So I want to apply it to different groups of, you know, concussion data, ADHD, PTSD, et cetera. And we have, we have all of these groups available. So I'm, I'm very interested in kind of moving forward with that. Okay, so this is my thank you slide. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I should acknowledge the NSF. Uh, they, they have partially funded me for this kind of work. Um, as well as I, I wanted to give you access to the preprint of the article, its own archive, um, as well as software. So if you're at all interested in using this, um, you know, I should say multi-node to VEC is not just made for analyzing functional networks of the brain. You can use this for anything. So if you have a, gra a sequence of graphs that you're interested in trying to understand what's the shared structure, you can use this type of method uh, to analyze it. So I know there's probably a lot of folks out here with other data science questions outside of neuroscience. It can be used outside of, outside of neuroscience, for sure. Um, so yeah, and here's my email and website if you have any other questions. All right, thank you so much. Great, so are there any questions? Yes, uh, actually there are a lot. Um, so correlation is probably the most widely used, um, but by all means you could use different types of dependence measures. Um, depending on how large your graph is, uh, you, would, you, know, use one, you would use one metric over another. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about that. So for instance, Gaussian graphical models and things like this for conditional dependence. Hmm? 
Yes. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, the, I have to say the, the one that I used, the metric that I used, is not per se. I mean, understanding the variability of a cluster is a common thing to want to do. Um, however, in this, I was lucky because we knew, we knew the actual subregion of each group, I mean, of each node. Right? So we were able to kind of compare embeddings across, across these different um, groups. Uh, I have to say that kind of just, I, I was thinking about it and I said variability makes sense to me because uh, we're trying to say something about the uncertainty overall or entropy overall of, the, of one brain, of the brain of one group versus another. And just in thinking about kind of the biological reasons, you would think there would be differences in that. Um, so, so that's what motivated me, uh, saying kind of uncertainty is going to be different, right? Um, are there other metrics you can use? Yes. Uh, and in fact, we're working on using many others. Um, so there are actually some kind of entropy type calculations and precision calculations that are used directly or have been used in the past um, on word to vec as well as kind of cosine similarity metrics. So, so there's a lot of ways of comparing clusterings. Um, the other thing I would say is with the kind of the adjusted RAND index, you know, that's a way of trying to understand if you have a partition that makes the most sense, can you compare that partition with the clustering that you got? So that's another thing we could have tried and that I did play around with. Yeah, thanks. Yes? Ah, complexity, totally complexity. So, uh, so doing the matrix factorization over something. So here we have a tensor of length 74 with 264 by 264 matrices. Um, running a matrix factorization on that would be much more difficult than running this method. Yeah, or take a lot more time, take a lot more time than this method. Yeah. But it is a good question. So you know, another, another kind of future direction would be how can we come up with a faster way of doing matrix factorization, right? 264 by 264 by 74. Um, but we're obviously interested in also doing larger. <laughs> but you can do like um, batch brains and you know, on, you know, on, uh, you know, we have like, uh, I mean, I forgot that a lot. Yeah. yeah, it'd be nice to compare those results. Yeah, to see kind of what we get. Yeah. 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 And the, the dimension of the embedding, that's just the, the smallest dimension that's not too small. Oh, the choice of 100? Yeah. I just liked 100. I was rounding off. Uh, no, but actually, so in all, the, in all the kind of results I was looking at with 100, um, I looked across, you know, I was looking across scales of in increments of 2. So I was saying d equals 2 up to 100. Um, and the same here. So I was looking across scales of 2. Um, so I just went up to 100, and I figured classification equaling 100% at some point makes me happy. Uh, but I probably could have stopped, you know, depending on where we are, maybe around 25 or 50. Uh, but I, I, 100 sounded nice and round to me. When you, when you say it with soft music playing, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. I,